Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this first Sunday in Lent. The season of Lent is bookended in a way by Ash Wednesday on one side and Easter Sunday on the other with 40 days in between, which is biblical language for a lengthy journey or sojourn. As we make that journey, Lent is about God joining us in the mess and the wonder, the doubts and the fears and the joys of living embodied in the way Jesus lived in the world, whose way we walk. And so at Easter, with its hope for newness of life, God does not pull resurrection out of a hat that morning. We make our way to Easter by way of Lent. Lent is our journey with Jesus through the reality of all that needs healing, all that needs life and hope in the world. Lent is God's way of expressing that love plays the long game. With Easter, love wins. It's good to be together on this journey of the Spirit. Music is always a huge part of how we explore our spirituality at Fairlawn, so please do scroll down below this video for the link to the music that accompanies the words in this service. Your worship will not be complete until that is a part of it too. And now here are some words of prayer to ease us into worship this first Sunday in Lent. You are with us, God of sunrises. You awaken us with each bright new day, flowing with promise. You are with us, inviting God, calling us to respond to all life's possibilities, to share compassion and hope. You are with us, gentle, loving God, drawing us into the presence of your peace, listening to the deep sighs of our hearts. At times, life can seem shrouded in mystery beyond our control. Despite all our knowledge, we wrestle with so much that we do not understand or misunderstand about life. We seek light to find a way into life's depths, life's meaning. Holy One, on mountain tops and valley floors, you reveal to us light like that, to see more fully, to glimpse glory. May we walk among one another and others as sisters and brothers, bearing light into dark places, hope to displace despair, and love that casts out hate and fear. In our worship, within our prayers and music, within our speaking and our listening, may wonder and praise begin anew, and may active loving never cease. And so we pray. Amen. Our reader and guest preacher this morning is Chris Leonard. Chris is a member of Fairlawn Avenue United who has enriched our worship with powerful expression through liturgical dance. Chris is also a theology student at Emmanuel College pursuing studies in response to a deep sense of calling to ministry, a call which we have experienced and which we have affirmed at Fairlawn. Chris is reading and then reflecting upon the story of Jesus' transfiguration in the Gospel of Mark as we begin this season of Lent.
The story of the transfiguration in Mark, when Jesus goes up a mountain with three of his closest friends and encounters God, transitions us as we enter the season of Lent, with its progressive focus on the journey of Jesus to suffering and the cross. That is where the story of the mountaintop experience will eventually take us. The disciples' experience is at one and the same time wondrous, frightening, powerful, unexpected, and rich. They see Jesus changed before them. Becoming transparent to God's presence, and they are changed too in the process. But they are also left with questions, as are we. Jesus' transfiguration should not be approached with the assumption that we can understand it in the way that we understand our usual experiences in life. There is a strangeness about this scene, but there is also a warmth and intimacy that draws us in. This is one of the three occasions in Mark where we overhear God speaking lovingly of Jesus. The other two are at Jesus' baptism and on the cross. Our reading is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines for you one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and one for you. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. They were coming down the mountain. He ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. At the transfiguration, O God, you showed Jesus in glory, a glimpse of what his disciples would see in his risen life. Bless us in our humanity with an awareness of your presence leading us to share in your divine life, even in our daily struggle. Help us to deepen our knowledge of the law and the prophets, channels of your grace throughout history and signposts for our journey. O Christ, upon the mountaintop, we ask your blessing upon your people who call on your name and who want to belong to the kingdom of light and life. Amen. The Transfiguration story is a story of mystery. 
it makes us think of miracles, possibilities, and the awesome power of the Trinity. The Transfiguration story is found in all three synoptic gospels of the Holy Bible. It is found in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. It makes us ask, why did this event occur? And what was it like to be there? As you may or may not know, what happens just days before the Transfiguration is that Jesus tells the disciples that he is going to die. That is best read in Matthew 16, 21. Jesus explained to his disciples that he would suffer in Jerusalem and be killed and that he would be raised to life. It was at that point that the disciples may have begun to have their doubts as to whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. They began to have difficulty in casting out demons in the name of Jesus because they had lost some of their faith in him. Biblical scholar Dr. Doug Bookman explains that the reason for the transfiguration was to increase the staggering faith of the disciples. Upon Jesus telling the disciples that he was going to be killed, it might have been altogether possible that they did lose faith in him. So then, might the transfiguration be a story of faith? It is a story of how three disciples had their faith increased on a mountaintop. Yes, this is a story of the divinity of Jesus Christ, and also it is about how three men were profoundly changed in a single moment. Imagine for a moment what it would be like to be a fisher who all of a sudden became a disciple of Jesus. What a change that must have been. One day you're sitting in a boat casting out your net and the next day you're casting demons out of people. That would be a pretty drastic shift. If Jesus came up to you later today and asked you to quit what you were doing and to start a new life, would you go? What would it take for you to believe that he was who he said he was? Would it take a miracle like the transfiguration on a mountaintop? Imagine again, if you will, what it would have been like to be taken to a mountaintop to witness the transfiguration. What would it have been like for those three disciples, Peter, James, and John? In the transfiguration, Jesus underwent a change, perhaps to strengthen his faith in preparation for him to be risen to life. And also, the change that Jesus underwent was a change that benefited the disciples. Jesus knew of the power of the Creator and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew of the power of those who came before him represented in this story. Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. Elijah and Moses standing on either side of Jesus represents what was foretold about his coming. Likewise, according to the Bible, mountaintops are the usual place one goes to meet with God. Think of Moses on Mount Sinai. When a person goes to a mountaintop, according to scripture, they are usually transformed in some way. For example, Genesis 8 tells us of the new covenant God made with Noah after the flood. It was on top of a mountain. And atop Mount Horeb, God spoke to Moses from a burning bush. Transformation is absolutely what happened atop the mountain of the Transfiguration. Jesus was transformed outwardly, and the disciples were transformed inwardly. If anything, this story can be read 
as the way learning about Jesus in his true divinity changes you. Imagine being one of the disciples and seeing an ordinary human man transfigure before your eyes, his clothing turning white, his face shining as bright as the sun. Imagine hearing from a cloud above you, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Would you? Would you listen to him? Would you fall face first on the ground at the very sight of him like the disciples did? Would you be terrified as the disciples were? Would you attempt to honor Jesus, Moses, and Elijah as Peter did? What would you do? I am speaking to you today in an act of testimony. I'd like to tell you a story, my story. I'd like for you to know how I got here. I'd like for you to know why I believe what I believe. Because when I read the transfiguration story, I remember my story. The transfiguration is a miracle story. I believe that miracles are real. They happen to ordinary, everyday people. They happen to fishermen, and they happen to Buddhist dance teachers. Before I was a Christian, I was raised as an atheist. And I mean atheist. Whenever I asked questions about God, I was met with something like, it's probably not possible, and why would God allow suffering? And so those were the sentiments I repeated. I remember saying almost the exact same script that my father said to me, to a Christian girl that I met in college. Bless her, I could have been kinder. And then at age 18, I began to study Buddhism. That was a safe practice in my household because I didn't have a god in that religion. It was just ethics and meditation. I was in a total self-health program at the Transformational Arts College just around the corner from Fairlawn. And at that program, they taught me how to manifest what I desired. Not unlike the thoughts behind the prosperity gospel. You would develop a mantra or prayer and focus all of your attention on it every day while deeply feeling with gratitude that your prayer had or would be granted. So having learned how to manifest at school, I decided that I was going to manifest my soulmate. I desperately wanted love and marriage and the happily ever after story. And I still do. I ended up developing the affirmation, I have unconditional love. And every day for it must have been three months, I spoke those words to myself. I have unconditional love. And I believed it wholeheartedly. This was the pivot point. This was the day everything changed. One day in May of 2018, I found myself sitting in meditation. It was around the time of my birthday. I was sitting in my bedroom and a text containing poems by Rumi flashed in the sunlight. I got up and I read one of the poems. It was on love. I thought it was so beautiful. So I sat down in front of my large window to meditate upon the poem. I was in silence for perhaps only 10 minutes when a miracle occurred. I noticed a shift in the energy of the room. It felt like the air became more dense or more full. I felt pressure on my skin 
akin to the difference in pressure one feels when submerged in water. My heart started to beat faster. I could hear the sound of wings, like some kind of vibration. And then I was surrounded by golden light. I felt warmer. I heard then a kind voice that started saying names that began with the letter J. Joseph, John, Justin, Jacob, Joshua, Jeremiah, Jehovah. And then I heard Jesus Christ. And then I saw before me a golden outline, very close, right in front of me. And I knew it was Jesus. And he spoke to me. He said, I love you. I have always loved you. And I always will love you. And that's all you need to know. But what you're asking for, we can't give it to you. Because humans don't know how to love unconditionally yet. But if you ask me, I will give it to you. What happened next, I'm not quite sure. It was as if my heart was opened and I was given unconditional love. It was the most wonderful feeling I've ever felt. In fact, I think it was the most profound and comforting feeling I've ever felt. I knew in that moment that I was completely and totally loved no matter what terrible things I had done, I was loved. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was real. And then as quickly as he came, he was gone. I immediately started my search for a church to go to. But what really cemented the deal was that I did what he told me to do. Frequently, I would find myself lonely and wishing to be loved. So I would, in a crude way, pray to receive love from him. And every time I would feel a warm spreading feeling in my chest, in my heart, and I would feel loved and I was changed, I began to believe in miracles. I believe that I understand what the disciples went through, at least in some small way, in seeing Christ Jesus transform into a divine being before their eyes. Think for a moment, if you will, what it was like to be one of those three disciples after you saw what you saw. If it were me, I wouldn't have been able to keep it a secret as they were instructed to do because I haven't been able to. And for a moment, let's assume that the story of the transfiguration is true. If you had been one of the three disciples that had seen Jesus transfigure into a divine being before your very eyes and see the prophets Elijah and Moses at his side, what would you do? The disciples must have felt shock, awe, surprise, admiration, and they must have been changed. They must have been so profoundly changed by that moment that, like me, they experienced it as a pivot point in their lives. What if God speaks to us still? What if God still speaks to us, not only through the scriptures, the stories of the past, but also in the present? What if miracles actually happen? Has a miracle occurred in your life? It doesn't have to be as dazzlingly brilliant as the transfiguration. Have you experienced a small miracle? What about everyday magic, like finding a quarter on the ground when you needed one for the shopping cart? Or a singular moment in your life that changed your tra trajectory? Marianne Williamson says that a miracle is a shift in perception from fear to love. 
If we can change our perspective, it's possible to see miracles in almost any place that we look. I pray that God gives a miracle to you in your life. And I hope and I ask that your eyes be open to the miracle of transfiguration and transformation. Seeing is believing. It would be hard not to trust Jesus after you saw such a miracle as the transfiguration happen. What would have happened to the disciples afterwards? Well, we can answer that scripturally, but it's harder to answer it in terms of how they would have felt. But as God condescended to tell the disciples the truth of Jesus, I believe that God did the same thing for me. I was so atheist that there would have been no way for me to believe in Jesus unless I had been given concrete proof. Peter, James, and John were given concrete proof of the divinity of Jesus Christ that day on the mountain of the Transfiguration. It would have been necessary in that moment for Jesus to have some implicit believers. Believers who knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was in fact the Son of God. Believers who would be able to spread the message of the Son of God after his death. Disciples who would be able to cast out demons due to unshakable faith. It would be necessary for God to have people who knew that Jesus was the Messiah. I had a pastor tell me once that if you've been touched by the Holy Spirit, you do not need evangelical training. I believe that because it is your training. God needs those who believe and God knows your needs. And God spoke to the disciples that day and God said, this is my son. Listen to him. I know that if God had said something like that to me, which dare I say God did, I would have listened. And I'm sure the disciples listened. I'm sure after the the, the transfiguration, the disciples believed that Jesus was the Messiah. What is God speaking into your heart? What is Jesus asking you to do in your life? How can we better follow Jesus? Can we have a stronger faith? Could we consider a stronger faith a miracle? Can you love more deeply? Could that be considered a miracle? And what has God said to us? This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Let us listen to what this story is saying. The story of the transfiguration is 100% miracle. And that doesn't mean it's not real. Julia Sager Scott now joins us playing a Celtic harp that is called the Clarsach. The Klarsach is a harp strung with brass wires instead of the usual gut strings. And Julia's is a copy of a Baroque Gaelic harp that was found in a castle in Scotland. She plays O'Carolan's Lamentation by Turloch O'Carolan.
As this pandemic time grinds on and on now in February, with the corrosive impact of physical distancing, limited contact across open space and disrupted living, we're all aware of the toll on our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health and well-being. Our phone ministry team at Fairlawn is doing an amazing job of keeping us connected, ensuring that no one is left out and that practical help is provided wherever possible. And that experience of belonging, that active loving, extends to those who are not members of the Fairlawn congregation but are a part of our wider community of care and partnership. Today, we're taking a moment, once again, to say thank you to you for all the ways we have come together as Fairlawn to support new directions and opportunities for ministry right through pandemic time. Good morning. My name is Mary Ellen Richardson, and I am the current chair of the Fairlawn Governing Council. We have been overwhelmed with the generosity of our Fairlawn community, a sign of your commitment to the work that we are doing together. We want to say thank you for this, for your commitment, your time, your financial support, for your participation in our many social justice activities. All of these things allow us to build supportive relationships with our Embrace Action partners and to realize our external ministry dreams. This week, our Embrace Action ministry lead, as a spokesperson for many other volunteers, will talk about what your commitment has allowed Fairlawn to do in the past and inspired us to continue to do. We look forward to working with you to support our many outside agencies as we live our faith and support our neighbours. Good morning. My name is Laura Schley and I chair Embrace Action here at Fairlawn. Last week you heard from Kathy Salisbury as she spoke about experience belonging and the ways in which our Fairlawn congregation has supported each other throughout the pandemic. Today, I'm here to offer a heartfelt thank you for all the ways in which our Fairlawn community has supported others in the community through our 
our Embrace Action work and our social justice work. I want to start by thanking you for your generous donations. Your kind gifts have allowed us to continue to support Camp Scugog as they change their programming for um, to adapt to the situation that we're in. Your donations allow us to continue supporting our refugee work as our team works to bring over um, a new refugee safely to Canada. Your donations continue allow us to continue supporting our walk-in support guests and our boarding home residents as um, we continue to support them through giving them gift cards. And your donations also allow us to contribute to our EA fund partners who we were able to make several contributions to throughout the year. Um, these include Fred Victor, Red Door Family Shelter, L'Arche, Street Health, Rainbow Railroad, Art Heart, and St. Luke's Out of the Cold program. Thank you as well for the items that you've donated. We ran two very successful drives this past year, thanks to all of you. We ran one for the Red Door Family Shelter at Christmas, accepting gifts of uh, children's uh, toys, knitted goods, and um, grocery gift cards. You'll see in a little bit later on um, a lovely thank you video from one of the Red Door residents um, thanking everyone who contributed to the drive. And thank you as well for the time that you have volunteered. There are so many initiatives that Fairlawn has run over the last year, including the craft and bake sale to raise money for Camp Scugog, writing uh, walk, uh, letters of support for our walk-in support participants, um, running our Change From Within sessions, um, where Fairlawn members confronted their, their white privilege and learned about anti-racism. Um, we ran our Do Black Lives Matter panel, uh, which attracted a lot of folks outside of Fairlawn as well. And we ran our annual Orange Shirt Day service in the fall. I have a quote from one of our walk-in support participants um, that really outlines how much Fairlawn's support means to her. She said, I greatly appreciate your constant generosity, kindness, and consideration. Thank you very much for your kind words with your heartfelt concern. Please always stay healthy and safe. Hopefully we can meet each other soon. It's clear the impact that our walk-in support volunteers have had on the guests who, who participate in walk-in support programming. And I'd also like to share a lovely thank you video from one of the Red Door Family Shelter residents um, sharing how much the, the Family Shelter gift drive meant to Hi, her. Hi, my name is Joanna, and I just want to say thank you to all for donating to the Red Door Shelter. Um, this year's been a tough year. Um, I'm a mom of four kids, so first I had to stop working when the school shut down, then I was laid off, then it was reduced hours. So when it got to around October, I was like, what am I going to do for Christmas? And I was thinking, I hope the giveaway happens again this year, but how are they going to do it? People don't have money, are they going to donate? So I just want to say thank you to you all. It means a lot, because otherwise I don't know what I would have given my kids. Thank you. So in these days of continued physical distancing and isolation measures, vaccine unpredictability and the need therefore to keep our church building closed to keep everyone safe, this church, Fairlawn Avenue United, remains wide open, open-hearted, open-minded, and as Laura has said, open to the world with opportunities for community, for connection, and for involvement. All because of you. Thank you. And now in this Lenten time together, let us gather our thoughts, our hearts, and our spirits in prayer. God of the vastness of the cosmos, of the mysteries of atomic particles, and the quiet beauty of snow in the forest, 
We do not live on mountain tops, but we too can and do glimpse your glory in the ordinary days of our lives and in the community of others in this wondrous world where your spirit continues to dwell and where you create still. When we come down from the heights of life's transformative experiences, when we glimpse timelessness and are met by your vastness in the intimacy of touch, we carry that with us into the world where we live renewed. Here we learn to look for you among people who have no power, who have no rights and no voice. We look for you among those who live on the streets of our city, whose housing is inadequate, whose homes are not safe. We look for you among those who grieve a past that is no more and fear a future that seems full of loss. God, who meets us in the broken places, shine the light of your life deep into our lives so that we may carry that light into dark places, confident in the one who knew you best and who walks with us still, whose brokenness is our healing. So we bring to you in words and in our hearts the weakness that overtakes our best intentions, the wounds that have not healed, the suffering that cries out for release. To you, we lift up our whole selves as we begin a Lenten journey within this pandemic time. Teach us, show us, Guide us in your pathways to hope and renewed living. May we be guided to places of preparation and transformation in our lives and in our world. Led through the wilderness places that we will encounter along the way. May we allow ourselves a time to focus, to clear our hearts and minds of distractions to reorient, and to be restored to our true selves. We bring to mind as well people who we know, who carry heavy burdens, worry, and stress. Those in need of healing. Those who are recovering. Those who are too much alone. O oh God, give us a quietly persistent voice to proclaim and to act out your healing love and your joy. We hold now in prayer those who are closest to our hearts as we keep silence. We pray together the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. After our service today, our coffee hour chat will gather around the virtual coffee pot online using Zoom. The details for connecting are in greetings and were included in the notice that you received this morning for this worship service. I hope you will join us in spirited conversation. And now as we go, some words and then some music of blessing. In the promise which is everywhere about us, hold us, God. 
in the longing for a new world and a new living. Embrace us, God, in the need to see moments of pure joy in our world. Guide us, God, in the hunger for justice that aches within us. Fill us, O oh God, in the yearning for love in each of our days and in our lives. Reassure us, loving God, go in peace.